you will know by now, if you've been here for any time at all, that normally I tell you a little story, and then I pray, and then I read the scripture, right? Well, today we're going to change that all up. Let's pray. Let the words of my mouth, O God, and the meditations of all of our hearts please you, like perfume raising to you. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of John, and I'm reading from verse 12 through um, chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him, and Martha served, and Lazarus was at one at the table, with him, and Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard and anointed Jesus' feet and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume, but Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, the one who was about to betray Jesus, said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief, and he kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. I invite you into some work and education on your own. This is one of those stories that appears in all four Gospels. It's the Gospel of John, chapter 12, and in that story, she's named Mary. Then it appears in Matthew 26. It appears in Mark 14. It appears in Luke 7. All of the stories are just slightly different. In some of them, she's an unnamed woman. In this one, and this is the only one, she wipes Jesus feet with her hair. Now, when I went to my commentaries this week, I learned the three most favored discussions, arguments, concerns. Are they Mary? Seem to be a number one question. Is it Mary who does this? And if it's Mary, which Mary? My question to you this morning is, does it matter? It may in your self-education later this afternoon. And then there's the whole issue of it foreshadowing. Foreshadowing Jesus washing the disciples' feet, foreshadowing his death and this perfumed preparation of the body for burial. That was number two. And number three, which I found in pretty much all of them, was this story is about death. Death is the underlying foundation of the story. And now I'm coming down because I would like us to have a conversation of a different sort. And I told you with change I was going to do this once in a while. Don't get nervous. It's not going to happen every Sunday. I know how this works. This, my friends, if we were having coffee at the table, I would tell you is my very favorite story in the whole Bible. I 
love this story. And for me, it is not important if it is Mary or some unnamed woman who performs this act with Jesus. The first thing I love about this story and I love about this woman is that she risks it all, doesn't she? She risks money, big money. They say that probably a year's wages is what it cost for this little bottle of perfume that she pours all over Jesus. I love that she risks her reputation, her reputation, the embarrassment of it. I mean, on some level, if you saw it in a movie, you'd kind of look away, right? It's like my husband would say, gross public display of affection. <laughs> right? Isn't it kind of like, wouldn't, wouldn't you be tempted to say, oh my gosh, she's so dramatic, right? And if it was today, what would happen on Facebook or Instagram, the vitriol? This horrible woman, do you know what she did to Jesus? She got actually down on the ground and she wiped her feet with her hair. Like, what is she thinking? I love this about her. I love that she didn't care that she loved Jesus this much in public. And see, we're living in a day where there's such um, conflict and disagreement between religious entities, right? So right off the bat, it does make me a little bit comfortable to talk this way, right? Because sometimes religious people who talk this way want to hit you over the head with a hammer, and that's not what I mean at all. I mean that this woman loved Jesus so much that this was the way she chose to show him that he was this special to her, right? So she risks it all. She puts up with all of their negative comments because the disciples are there in some of the stories. And it's the disciples, not Judas, in some of the stories telling Jesus, how can you let her get away with it, right? We also don't have the context of the position of women, and that is a layer to the story, right? So then, number two, she does this act of love with such pure authenticity and vulnerability. We talked about vulnerability a couple of weeks ago and how it, important it is to relationship and how now it's such a hard thing and we talked about it in the context of loneliness. How could you be more vulnerable than taking your prized possession and offering it up for the possibility of complete rejection, right? I mean, Jesus could have said, you foolish woman, get out of here, right? Why'd you waste this perfume on me? He doesn't, but she risked that from him. So she does it with pure emotion, with true emotion, with a kind of honesty that's really hard in relationships, isn't it? Isn't it hard to be honest in love with another person, possibly not with your spouse or partner, but other people, friends, to offer that kind of generous, vulnerable act in such a big way? I love that about her. And number three, I think that Jesus commends her for this. I think Jesus was really quite moved by this. And if we go one step further, I think that he blesses these kinds of generous acts that we do with him and God and with each other. I think that when we're generous 
in the kind of way that she was, where we're willing to risk it and we're willing to pour it all out, right, vulnerably, whether we're rewarded in the moment, maybe not, and maybe so, but I think it adds to our whole circle of love, right? I um, have said before in sermons on stewardship that in my life I've had times where I was kind of eccentrically, impulsively generous, like seeing a storekeeper having a bad day and buying them flowers. And I told one of my congregations that I wanted them to do anonymous acts of giving generosity that no one would know and practice it that week. And one came back the next Sunday and said, I tried to pay for someone's lunch. And they said, why would you do that? And I said, because my minister told me I had to. <laughs> Go do it. Go do generous acts, anonymously or otherwise. It's only your reputation on the line, right? It's only people saying, whew, is your minister weird, right? What is the risk in being generous? I think it might be worth it. And in this story, I love that 2,000 years later, it's remembered. Whether it was Mary or some unknown woman, we know and read the story. It's been told again and again and again. This woman and her perfume with Jesus were important enough to include in our lexicon by a whole group of men. They decided it was important we knew this story. There's something in this story for us. And lastly, I think she calls to us through the generations. You can hear her call, can't you? It's kind of a call for freedom to love. You know, Friday night I got to go to um, the symphony and it was a very different um, program on Friday night, Byron Sterling, who I had never heard of, heard of until Friday night, is, was trained at Eastman, but he led us on a journey of the blues and jazz. And he's a trumpeter, he's a director, he's a singer, and there was uh, a man, he had to be in his 80s, who played the piano and the Hammond organ. He grew up playing the Hammond organ in his small back, black church in the South, and man, he could make that little organ rock, right? A friend of mine that went with me that doesn't go to church said, if I could hear an organ like that every Sunday, I'd go to church. Um, it was a totally different kind of music than we enjoy. No offense, Sam, we love your organ. <laughs> but what was interesting to me was Byron said, jazz? that started in New Orleans was about freedom. Interesting idea. It was about loving music and having the freedom to express it in your way with your soul in the way that spoke to you. Because they would take sometimes classical tunes and then rift on them, right? and make it their own. And I think this is what this woman did. She had the freedom and pursued the freedom in her love to show her love in the way that was meaningful for her and turned out to be very meaningful for Jesus. Now the hard part about this story is translating it culture to culture. As Try as I might, I couldn't come up with another story that equaled it, or a way to put her actions into our culture, and I think it's because Jesus isn't here in person. So it's going to be up to each of us to figure out what a gift like that would mean 
to Jesus if you wanted to do it, and what a gift like that would mean to a friend or to a spouse, to a family member, how you might do that. Um, maybe the gift of a kidney or a heart or something like that. I don't know. That one I have to think about. What I came up with was thinking about Corinthians 13. We may be educated and professional and good at our jobs. We might be efficient and articulate and smart as whips, but if we're not loving, how will it matter in the end? We may be refined and well-mannered and really socially appropriate, but if we don't love, how does it help us? We may solve problems and be really good with our time. We might manage big budgets and huge companies. But if we don't show love to our neighbor, love to God, what's the point? If I concentrate all of Lent on Christ's death, and I live in sackcloth and ashes, and I eat no meat, and I have no fun all of Lent, I've missed the point, right? There's something foundationally in Lent about love. Love, my friend, looks a lot like this brave woman who gave her perfume and her money and her love and poured them all over Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair because she risked it. She risked it for faith. She risked it for hope. And most of all, she risked it for love. And she gives us a good picture of what that looks like. But now it's up to each of us and us collectively together to figure out how we do that same thing in our lives and out in the world. Amen.